Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for coming to the Birmingham Business Alliance's Governmental Affairs Committee meeting. I'm Elizabeth Paul and I serve as Manager of Public Policy for the Birmingham Business Alliance. Just a few housekeeping items. This meeting will be recorded and it will be available on the Birmingham Business Alliance's website. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please use the chat function to send them in and we'll have a moderated Q&A at the end. Um, I'll ask the participants, please make sure that they're muted when they're not speaking. And now I'll turn it over to our chair of the Government Affairs Committee, Mary Pat Lawrence with Protective to get us started. Well, thanks, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Elizabeth said, I'm Mary Pat Lawrence. I'm with Protective Life in the Government Affairs Department. Um, just want to say thanks to everybody for joining today. Um, we have a very exciting guest here with us um, to speak to us today, which I will get to in just a minute. But first, um, Daryl and Elizabeth um, have an update for us from the legislative session. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back to them for just a few minutes for that update. We'll also take questions um, and then we'll, we'll turn it back to our speaker. Um, so Daryl, Elizabeth, are you ready to give your update? Yes, thank you, Mary Pat. No problem. So we've gotten two weeks into the state legislative session and we're off to a great start. The BBA went into the session with a number of legislative priorities to pass the renewal of the Alabama Jobs Act, the renewal of the Growing Alabama Credit, a bill to provide COVID-19 liability protections for businesses, a research and development tax credit bill, and a bill to renew the state historic tax credit. I'm excited to report that three of these five priorities have already been passed and signed into law by Governor Ivey. The Jobs Act and the Growing Alabama Credit both expired last year and were temporarily extended by Governor Ivey in an emergency proclamation. The reauthorization of both programs was addressed in HB 192, sponsored by Representative Bill Poole in the House and carried by Greg Reed in the Senate. These incentives have helped secure a number of large scale projects, which has created quality jobs in our area and the state, and they'll continue to aid in the development of new industrial sites. Both economic development incentive programs will be extended until July 21st of 2023, and the annual cap for the Alabama Jobs Act will be increased from 300 million to 325 million in 2021, and in 2022, it'll be increased to 350 million. Incentives will also be enhanced for both black and women owned businesses. The annual cap for the growing Alabama credit will be increased from 10 million to 20 million annually. Another BBA priority, SB 30, sponsored by Senator Arthur Orr, provides businesses, healthcare workers, churches, and other entities with COVID-19 civil liability protections. These protections include civil immunity from certain claims and damages brought by individuals who allege that they contracted or were exposed to COVID-19, as long as those entities adequately follow guidelines issued by their government related to operating during the pandemic. Ultimately, this provides necessary protections for both, both our small and large size businesses. Moving forward, we'll be focusing on passing a research and development tax credit and renewing the state historic tax credit. House Bill 244, the Alabama Research and Development Act is sponsored by Representative Danny Garrett. This bill would implement a research and development tax credit for certain businesses in Alabama. It will limit the tax credits to no more than 25 million of credits for R&D expenses in a calendar year, and no eligible business could claim more than 20% in a single tax year. We're working to get this bill up in committee next week. Another priority, House Bill 281, sponsored by Representative Victor Gaston, would authorize $20 million of Alabama historic tax credits annually for an additional seven years through 2029. This bill will be up for a vote in the House Ways and Means Education Committee on Wednesday. We've been working with a number of partners to make sure that the state historic tax credit is renewed since the legislation is set to expire in 2022. This tax credit provides jobs, increases the tax base, and revitalizes existing buildings. Overall, session is very different this year. There's not as much in-person access to legislators because of COVID, but we're reaching out via email, phone, and text. And we've also been laying the groundwork on these priorities and more over the past several years. After a one week break last week to evaluate COVID protocols, the legislature is back in session tomorrow for week three and their seventh legislative day. Over the next four weeks, the legislature will meet for 10 legislative days followed by another one week break. Session must end by May 17th. 
Now I'll turn it over to Daryl Perkins, the BBA's legislative consultant and lobbyist to update us on several other bills of interest. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, the budgets are in good shape this year. As most of us on this, on this Zoom call knows, we actually had very good years last year. Uh, the ed budget was 7.2 billion last year, projected to be 7.5 this year. The general fund budget was 2.3 billion last year, projected to be 2.6 billion. That's an increase of about $360 million. So even during the pandemic, our, our budgets are actually in very good shape. I suspect primarily because of the simplified sales and use tax and some other things, but we're, we're in good shape budget wise. Uh, probably won't move this week, but probably a week after next, more or less. To me, one of the most fascinating bills this session, while it's not on our agenda, but it is important, and it's a, it's a big piece of legislation, and that is SB 214 by Senator Marsh. Uh, Senator Marsh felt so strongly he stopped being a pro tem to work on this. It's the all-inclusive gaming bill, uh, it's a lottery, it's casino, it's sports wagering. Uh, it has moved through the Senate. Uh, there's some debate going on right now. Uh, it has five spots uh, to do the, cas the casino and, and, the, and the wagering. Uh, the racetrack in Birmingham is one of them, Green Track, Victory Land. So I'm sure there has been some intense negotiation during this week on where there'll be more besides these five and where will they be? We know Dothan, the Wildgrass wants one. Other, other folks want one. So how will it look going, going forward? It's fascinating to me from a legislative perspective of what's the bill going to look like, but, but also what does the money move to on, on, on behind the scenes, if you will? Uh, where is the Porch Creek money? What does it flow out of? Uh, the Moose McGregor money is still in play. What happens with that? So. Those are the kind of things I suspect are being discussed right now uh, with people doing the work. Uh, there is a bill uh, that we've been tracking, we have concerns with, SB 227 by Senator Butler. It's the Pharmacy Benefits Manager Bill. Uh, Blue Cross and others have concern with this. PBMs, Pharmacy Benefit Manager Bills. Uh, this is the two that could potentially employers use of cost savings around, pharmacy, around pharmaceuticals and their prescriptions. If this bill passes, it will take away a tool the employers use to keep down costs. So anytime we see that, we always have concerns. So that's SB 227, uh, Pharmacy Benefits Manager, we do have concern with that. There are two bills and we are watching these because you know, of a potential impact uh, that affect, away, affect the way the Emergency declarations are made. Uh, one's a statewide bill, SB 97, and one's a local bill that only affects Jefferson County. So right now, for instance, the governor can make a declaration, and that can last 60 days, and then it could be redone. Uh, this will take away the follow-up and limit it from 60 days to 14 days. So if there's an extension, it's down to 14 days in this bill if it passes the way it looks now. And it puts the extension with the Speaker of the House and the Senate pro tem or a joint resolution by House and Senate if we're in session. So we, we need to watch that just to make sure as, as business folks, we know if there is another declaration, hopefully not, this is, this is a new process if this bill passes. But we are, we are certainly tracking that bill. There are a number of what we call uh, social bills that we follow. Uh, there are five or six. I won't go through all of them, but just know that there is a bill to repeal Common Core. And so that's the concern for this. That's HB 383 by Representative Mooney. Uh, so we are certainly watching Common Core. There are a number of others. Uh, I'll take questions if I need to. I didn't want to go through the whole process for time, but there are a number of the bills we are either working on and or tracking. So Elizabeth, that's all I have, unless someone has a question. That's great, Daryl um, and Elizabeth, thank you so much. I know they were very, very busy last week. Um, they got a lot accomplished. So I know there's a lot to report on and we're just getting started. So thanks for that update. 
I don't see any questions that have come through, um, Elizabeth, unless I'm missing anything. Um, so if not, um, let's turn to our speaker who's here with us um, today. As I mentioned, we have a terrific guest with us, um, Cornell Wesley, the new director of the Department of Innovation and Economic Opportunity for the city of Birmingham is our speaker. We were laughing before about um, the acronym and the lengthy uh, name of the department there. So hopefully I got that right, Cornell. But for those of you who are not familiar, the IEO is the Economic Development Department for the city and is responsible for creating economic vitality through innovation and inclusive growth. Um, Cornell is a native of Birmingham. He grew up in Titusville, attended A.H. Parker High School, and then graduated from Morehouse College with a degree in economics. Um, I, he previously served as the economic development rep for Oklahoma and North Texas for the U.S. Department of Commerce, I believe in Oklahoma City, Cornell, but you'll let us know. Um, in that role, he managed more than $20 million of federal investment creating more than 4,000 jobs and yielding 1.5 billion in economic uh, impact and private investment. So Cornell, I think you've been on the job, you said about six weeks. So we're really excited to hear from you. Um, would love to know what it's like being back in Birmingham, what your day-to-day -day, um, role is like and what your plans are for um, director of the department um, of the IEO. So with that, um, Cornell, I uh, don't see you on the screen, but I, I think you're out there somewhere. So I am, I am, okay, can you hear great. me? Yes, absolutely. So with that, uh, thanks for being here. We really appreciate it and look forward to hearing your comments. I'll turn it over to you. Well, this is truly exciting to, to have an opportunity to share with this committee uh, via the Birmingham Business Alliance. I, I'm elated to, to be introduced and to quite candidly be back in the city of Birmingham. Um, as mentioned uh, in the biographical sketch, I'll, I won't bore you with all of those details, but I'll give you a couple of different things that I think are kind of cool. Um, I have served in the federal capacity uh, in the past for about five and a half years, uh, working under two presidential administrations, the Obama administration and the Trump administration. And in that role, uh, as mentioned, uh, I was responsible for the deployment of our taxpayer dollars uh, to, to areas that have been historically disinvested for the purposes of generating some stimulus and some economic activity. Uh, I've been blessed and fortunate to have a documentable success in that role to the tune of, as highlighted, about a 1.5 billion impact to that region. And so because of those successes, you know, I, I, I actually launched a firm shortly thereafter focusing on economic development consulting prior to relocating here to Birmingham and serving in the Woodfin administration. I am, again, just truly honored that uh, Mayor Woodfin uh, gave, extended this opportunity and to all of the chiefs. Uh, this has just truly been an amazing uh, six weeks. It's been, uh, no day has been the same. Uh, it's been, uh, it's been some, some time getting uh, introduced to the city because it is a very different city than when I left almost 20 years ago. And for that, I, I, I applaud everyone on the phone because you've done an amazing job in generating so many amazing amenities and opportunities that the city now provides. And my hope um, is that I'm able to be in value add to the administration in terms of continuing on that on that pathway. So very quickly, you know, I won't bore you and I won't keep you. I'm not long winded, but I will tell you kind of what informs my approach to this job. There are very there are six things that I really focus on in terms of economic development. And, and those six things are kind of what will inform how we function here as a department. Um, and, and of course, if there's any questions in the interim, by all means, drop them in the chat and I will do my best to answer what I can. And I will preface by saying six weeks, guys. So please be easy on me uh, and, and, and know that there's, there's going to be some ramp up time uh, until I fully have my hands on everything. But in terms of those six ingredients, and then I'll tell you the, the, the nexus of why it's six is because I, I oftentimes in my career would get asked, you know, you see a lot of projects, you, you've worked in many communities, what, what communities are doing it well, that, that are generating growth, that are creating impact, that are serving and, 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 and driving private investments at those areas. And, and, and while there's many different things that we could kind of encapsulate, here are the six that I think we focus on. Uh, and then they're known in specific order, so don't think they're prioritized. But the first one is E, is e for entrepreneurship. And so uh, our office 
champion small business opportunity. The function here is to be intentional in our efforts to focus on creating an ecosystem where entrepreneurial activity can flourish. So what does that look like? I believe the city's role and specifically the department's role is to be an uh, intermediary to these strategic partnerships like the Birmingham Business Alliance, like Rev Birmingham, um, and many other uh, opportunities and partners, even from the Woodlawn Foundation and all of the other acronyms in between that I have yet to learn all of. But we function as an intermediary and a resource provider. We want to get you in the right place, but in, in as much as we can help with the tools that are available in our toolbox, we want to be intentional. And you can continue to hear me say that word uh, in our efforts in creating that ecosystem where businesses can thrive from partnering with our SBDCs from a technical assistance standpoint to capital and placing that in the market. I think that there's a role that the city can play in deepening our, our opportunities and our tools uh, to deploy from a capital standpoint, but it also in, in encourages or it will require that our financial institutions be a part of that conversation as well. So E for entrepreneurship, the second point that involved, that kind of focuses is, is the M for municipality. Uh, so that's an inward and an external look. Uh, inward, how are we servicing you? Uh, are there efficiencies and things that we can improve upon that make your customer experience better when you're engaging with the city? Uh, and then internally, what new to tools should we create if we don't have the appropriate tool to answer that question? As I've touched on entrepreneurship and talked about capital, one of the things that I think, again, we can focus on is where does the city fit um, in terms of uh, not the big dollar items, but those micro enterprises who only need ten dollars to $15,000 to get started. Now, I'll pause and say, statistically, less than you know 1% of all Fortune 500s that have started have started with $10,000 or less. So we can really look at that data point and know that if the city can play a role in, uh, in either being an intermediary to the resource or being a direct provider of the resource, that's one of the areas I think we can play a, a significant role in. So let's, go, let's continue, E for entrepreneurship, M for municipal growth, B for business and industry. And this speaks directly to everyone on the call. Um, it is important, it is incumbent upon all of us to have a seat at the table. If we are not at the table, that means we are on the menu and I know nobody on this line wants to be E. And so I want to break down any barriers of communication in terms of our business partners to truly understand what their unique needs are. Here's why that's important. Attraction is gonna always be a, a hot point for any community across the nation. But I also wanna have a focus on our retention and expansion efforts. And I can only, and, and we, along with the Birmingham Business Alliance can only be successful if you are voicing what you need, being a part of the conversation and having a seat at the table. I tell you that this table is a large table and we want you here. We wanna hear from you. And, and, and I want you to know that our door is always open. So EMB, and it's all gonna stand for emblem. Uh, the next letter in that is L, lending and access to capital. I'm a former banker, don't hold that against me, but I understand the importance of deploying resources in our community. Um, Alabama itself, uh, along with the region, is a very conservative lending environment. Why do I say that? There are not many preferred lenders of the SBA, and that kind of speaks to deal flow and, 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 and how our financial institutions are viewing uh, certain deals, you will understand that startups are by definition not very lendable, uh, which is why the SBA and USDA and other tools that are used to provide a government guarantee to minimize the risk with the bank so that, that that deal becomes a little bit more palatable. There's a sweet spot there that we can play in from revolving loan funds at the federal level or even creating our own unique tools to, again, fill in the gap in terms of deploying resources to really generate some growth. And then there's the last two letters, uh, E for education. Uh, it is important, and you hear me say this often, it's important for our education providers, our UABs, our, our, our Jeff States, uh, to, to truly, including Birmingham Southern, to truly look at their curriculum offerings and marry them to the demand that's not just in our city, but in our region um, and how we define that. If there is no point, no, no point in having a major uh, underwater basket weaving if there's no demand for it. And so we, we view our educational partners as workforce development agencies, even if they don't view that themselves. You are pipeline and talent that we hope to retain and put right back to work. Uh, and so uh, it's 
they play a significant role. I want to break down whatever barrier that may have existed. If there isn't one, then I want to be intentional in communicating with you how we can best suit our business community, uh, whether that be tailored certifications or whether that's degreed uh, or whether that's working with our vocational uh, institutions. We want to be able to prepare people for the jobs we want to be able to inhabit. And then finally, uh, the marketing piece. You know, if you Google Birmingham, uh, it has a storied history. We know and we own our civil rights story, but there's a unique opportunity from all of us that are on this line to tell a new story and talk about all the amazing things that are happening in Birmingham. Uh, I don't want the first thing you Google about Birmingham is to be our, while we acknowledge our storied past, it should be about our vibrant future. And so we all have a unique opportunity to really begin to talk about who do we want to be when we grow up and how do we marry that with messaging uh, and not just regional messaging, messaging, but national. Here's a great point. I'm certain that we all sit on our couches in the evening sometimes, whether that's with a cold beverage or whatever have you, and you're watching your commercials and you see some community pop up, whether it's in Arkansas or Georgia, and they're, they're messaging why you should be in Atlanta or why you should be in Little Rock here in Alabama. So it's a, we have a unique opportunity to begin to really tell that story. The state has done a good job with it, but I want our region to really think about what that looks like moving forward and to begin to truly champion and highlight all of the amazing things that are happening in, in Birmingham. And so all those six ingredients stand for emblem. Again, entrepreneurship, municipal growth, business industry, lending, access to capital, education, and marketing. Those, those six things, while there are so many other things, are foundational ingredients for how we kind of approach economic development. And so we're gonna use those things to inform our decisions uh, along with the tools that are available to us, as well as mirroring that with the mayor's platform uh, to be intentional in our efforts and serving you appropriately. And so that's, that's what we're doing. That's what we're charged to do. And I hope with your help, we are able to accomplish those things. So at this time, I'll, I'll open it up for some questions. Uh, if you have any, if you don't, God bless you, I appreciate it, but I'm certain maybe we got one or two and I'll, I'll be delighted to answer those things that are specific to our department or rather to Cornell himself. That sounds great, Cornell. Thanks for that update, that was terrific. Um, I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> um, so I, I don't, I've got a couple questions that came in through the chat, but does anybody have a direct question they wanna ask Cornell before I uh, read those off? Um, I'll just pause for a second, to see if anybody wants to speak up. I do because I don't know how to use a chat thing. Okay, great, Daryl. <laughs> Love the honesty. <laughs> Go ahead. Home, when we're talking about growing small minority business, if you talk to a small business, they will tell you access to capital is a problem. Yeah. If you talk to a lending institution, they will tell you capacity to lend that small business is a problem. How do you marry those two up and solve that, that divide, if you will, when capacity- well, and, and that's that's a great question. And as a former banker, you know, they're going to view, you know, again, anybody on here, they got those five C's of credit. That's how they're measuring it. Um, uh, conditions have changed, capacity, credit, collateral, all of those things are what's important. That's why we have to have these government guaranteed and these other tools that can go alongside the financial industry or, or our institutions, uh, because they are measured differently. While we as a city want to see the deal happen, they are in the for-profit business. And so they have investors and all of these different things. There's only so much risk they're going to take on. And I think you understand this, right? So our, our sweet spot, again, is to continue to push and champion the usage of these government guarantee things while looking at CDFIs, CDCs, and other federally designated organizations that can receive capital but are designed to take on more risk. I think, again, the, CD, the, the city has a, a unique opportunity. We're, we're, we're in deep conversation. I won't say that it's, it's concrete, but we're in deep conversation about where we fit in the revolving loan fund conversation so that we can then make somebody lendable. The goal is to become lendable. Uh, and, but it becomes, again, to your point, a chicken or egg. You know, does it fit our credit box or do we have a demand for it? Uh, I don't think it's really a capacity. They have, they have the cash. It's just a matter of whether it's a fit for their credit box. And that, what, what that means is uh, not every institution wants to engage in gas station and C-store lending. Not every institution wants to engage in hotel lending. 
not every institution wants to even engage with small business lending. So now that becomes an education process for us as small business owners to understand what their credit mix, what their focus is, if we're even pursuing the traditional route. But again, not everybody's gonna get that traditional dollar. And so in this environment, I wanna promote CDFIs, the further creation of them, more CDCs, the further creation of those, and more revolving loan funds, whether that's through our Rev Birmingham, Impact Birmingham, or any other entity, it's important that they become resource providers and, and gateways to, uh, to capital as well. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, Cornell, we did have one uh, question come in about infrastructure. Um, and the question is, how do you view the role and importance of infrastructure to successful economic development in the region? And I would just add to that, you know, it looks like um, the Congress may take up an infrastructure bill. And so yeah. have you given any thoughts to how Birmingham can be front and center and considered with our delegation on any infrastructure uh, projects? So Absolutely. Listen, you... listen, Go ahead. We, we, without infrastructure, there's no development. Uh, you have to have water, sewer, broadband, fiber. All of these things are the foundations of uh, of how someone actually can put the building together. If there's no water, you know, if there's no water sewer under the ground, if there's no access to global connectivity, i.e. broadband and fiber optics, how can the business exist? And so it's similar to our king to building a house. If you go to an industrial park and it's just flat land, that's not an industrial park. And you would not believe how many times I've taken tours of just open space that they viewed as industrial park. It is not a park until that infrastructure is in the ground and available for, for further development. So it is uh, more than important. It is truly part of the foundation that makes all of these other projects that exist. This is why Alabama Power is so significant. This is why our energy providers are so significant because they are infrastructure providers. They have to be in the room. You know, we have to be able to price it accordingly to that industry and who we want to serve or and or attract. These things cannot be separated from the conversation. Great. Thanks, Cornell. Um, anybody else want to ask a direct question before I get to some that are coming in through the chat? Um, I'll just stop for a second. Um, okay, well, we've got one question. Um, Cornell, what's your impression of Birmingham's success and new business within the Opportunity Zone? Wow, that is, uh, that's a great question. So weeks, Opportunity right? Zone uh, <laughs> is, is, is a unique asset. And I think, um, I think our greatest opportunity lies in some of the equity plays. I think from an industry standpoint or just from an environment standpoint, everybody kind of got their hand around the real estate portion. They know if you invest in real estate with a capital gain and you can hold it for their particular period of time, then you can reap the benefit of, of, the, uh, of the exit tax-free. I think everybody kind of got that piece. But the, the, I think the most underutilized portion is the ability to invest in businesses by way of equity positions of those businesses that occupy uh, spaces in the zones. I think there's an opportunity for not just Birmingham, but the entire state to really begin to champion. How do we use that aspect uh, to really drive growth, not just in the urban core, but in its surrounding areas. Um, here's the thing, uh, Birmingham may not again be able to attract some of your big box retailers or Fortune Fives. We may not be able to get Google. We've been successful with Amazon and FedEx, uh, but those are anomalies, full stop, they are. But if we are able to grow a Google, leverage them, and they're birthed out of one of these particular corridors, what an amazing story that it, it could potentially be, and it makes business sense because it will yield the same amount of impact, profitability, and the, if you are a, a, a capitalist, you know, the same tax play or position that you saw on the traditional real estate piece. So yes, simply put, uh, we have an organization, uh, Opal, that we're looking to continue to partner with and leverage uh, their assets that we've identified, those assets that may be redeveloped being the real estate lane, guess what? They can occupy micro enterprises inside of them. So those can be potential tools. So I'm looking at all of those sorts of things and seeing where we can champion and play a significant role. Great. May I ask another question, please? Sure. Go ahead, Daryl. Well, Birmingham was built on rail and manufacturing, but the last few years, 
I think we're not taking advantage of that the way we should, both from a rail perspective, and i.e. transportation and manufacturing, i.e. supply chain. How do you see us playing a bigger role in both of those going forward? Well, I can speak to the manufacturing um, and, and, and you can't because it really is direct, in many cases directly related to the rail. Uh, one of the first things I did was sat down with Birmingham Business Alliance, uh, Mark Brown, who I'm certain is on the line, on the line. I said, listen, I want to convene a manufacturing roundtable. I came from a manufacturing hub. This is something I understand. And quite candidly, we, Birmingham, uh, has been known for and, and, and it's his, his, and its story past. So it's, while innovation is amazing, while all of the fun things that are happening are great, I don't want us to lose sight of the, those big job creators like our, uh, our supply chain and logistics, like manufacturing that have been here, that have been tenants of this community for decades. So if you are here, me, if you are there and you are on this call, know that you are a focus and a priority of this office and of this administration. We want to re-engage our manufacturing community because I understand that you want to move your products, not just domestically, globally. And, and the biggest asset we have to be able to do that is our rail. We have amazing rail that have, provides connectivity across both, both sides of the country. But one other util, one underutilized resource we also have is the Birmingham pool, which creates opportunity from a foreign direct investment standpoint that as soon as we're able to, as soon as I'm able to wrap my hands around its, its unique functionalities in, in different ways that it can co provide connectivity, know that I want to marry that, that port with that rail and I want to engage our manufacturing community because I want to see them scale and hire more and expand right here in Birmingham. And, and trust and believe we're going to do everything we can as an office to support those initiatives. Cornell, if I may, you, you touched on opportunity zones. And yes. nationally, that has gotten a bad rap for not really functioning the way it was designed to. My yeah. experience is it's worked really well in some cases, not so well. Talk yeah. us through opportunity zones the way you see it. How does it work and or not work? Well, the, the, the biggest piece is the capital piece, um, right? And then you have to have projects lined up. So theoretically, you have probably some communities who've done, who haven't done it well that just weren't positioned from the receiving of the dollars or the deployment of the dollars. Like uh, Atlanta, for example, has a half a billion dollar fund. Uh, but they identified projects on the front end prior to the cash arriving. And they also were very intentional about how they administer uh, those funds as well. So I think it's really a preparation uh, and an education standpoint. It was a new tool. It was hot. It was well publicized, but not a lot of people really delved into the weeds of the functionality. And then let's, let's be very clear, Mr. Perkins, uh, not many people, uh, Birmingham is a, a majority African-American community. Uh, historically, African-Americans have not invested in such a way that have generated a capital gain. So it doesn't create an all-inclusive opportunity to, to reap the benefit. So there's very few people who make enough to even have a gain, and then they have the option to be extremely selective in where those dollars are deployed. Our role is to be positioned. Our role is to have the projects ready and shovel ready, which we do, to receive those funds and then be able to pass on those benefits. Our other role is to be able to educate our communities, not just African-American, but all citizens of Birmingham who are not financial literate, to be able to build with so that as these tools continue to come online, they too are able to reap the benefit and participate as well. And there's some unique opportunities to do that even today. I won't dwell into the weeds, but I'll just pinpoint, if you designate your zone a particular way, then you can free up 30% of that, that cash to go the traditional route. That 30% can then receive dollars from those who don't have a game. So we can begin to leverage this, 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 debt, this legislation to kind of level the playing field as well, if we are thinking creative. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Mary Pat, I have one more question and I'll stop, I promise. Okay, that sounds good. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this subject and that is Brownfield Grayfield. I think somebody Probably just dropped that in the chat box too. I think so. <laughs> in that area, we don't want to create a super fund site, but we do want to engage with the EPA and the federal government and our business partners on getting those brownfields and great fields back online and creating those those shovel ready industrial sites you, you talked about a minute ago. 
how, how do we do that? Well, we, we, we delve into the federal alphabet soup for those measures and layer those in with our existing resources. Fortunately, uh, I've, I come from an agency that focused in brownfield redevelopment. So this is something that I can actually speak to from an ex experiential standpoint. Um, so EDA and EPA are my two big, big pockets of resources or opportunities here in, Al in Birmingham specifically. And I can say that they have been underutilized here in the city which gives us a great opportunity, specifically in this environment where we know that another package is coming online and even the previous package has not been exhausted. So for us, in order to build the reputation or rather the credibility and the, and the track record, we need to identify and come out the gate with a big ask from the federal government to identify one of the most defunct or uh, like a Mark Steele in Titusville. Uh, that has been a gray field for over 20 plus years. Uh, let's get it clean and let's get it redeveloped, leveraging federal resources and making it site ready. Yes, simple answer is yes, I'm, I am. That's a priority. Uh, I know how to access those resources and, and I can almost guarantee that we will. Elizabeth and Mary Pat, this is Nan. I have a question. Um, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Hi, Cornell. Great to see you. Uh, my question is, is regarding BOLD, the Building Opportunities for Lasting Development grant that your division manages. Um, we understand that there's limited funding and we're going through that cycle right now. And we understand that um, it's impossible to fund every organization that has a play in economic development. Um, so my question centers around the whole limited funding aspect. How do you see and what plans does your organization have to continue collaborative efforts and partnerships with economic development organizations like ours beyond BOLD, the BOLD grant? Well, oh, you, you, you drop it in on me. Well, you know, um, you touched on a couple of different things. One, obviously uh, we experienced some constraints in our funding due to the pandemic and so I understand and am sensitive to how that impacts our historical strategic partners who've been recipients of these, these resources. Um, again, our goal is to look and be, begin to be creative in what other opportunities we can create. Right now, that's one of the ones that we only have in the toolbox that functions in that world. I'd be elated and delighted to work with uh, our, our partners to think about what other tools do we need to create within the city uh, to continue to fill in that gap? Again, while it's not our job to underwrite, it is our job to support and to create an ecosystem where these opportunities lie. And so I, I'd be, to give you a direct answer to say that we created something today, we haven't. Uh, what we have today is what has been used, but what we have tomorrow can involve yourself and all of our partners on the phone about what we need to further increase our impact and provide tools that can then be leveraged for further impact in your community. So I know that's not exactly what you're looking for, but I, I'm, I'm telling you that we will be intentional. As I've said, that's going to be my keyword for the day. We're going to be intentional in trying to figure out how we can continue to support you. I anticipate conditions change, right? I anticipate our environment, our economic environment improving beyond what we experienced in the pandemic. And hopefully um, our resources will come back to historical numbers so that we can continue to do the work. But this has also created a great opportunity to reevaluate how those dollars have been used and who, the, who have been the recipients of those dollars. And so I'll push back and say this, uh, anyone who receives uh, resources uh, from the city, uh, it will come with an impact expectation. And so just because you've historically been a recipient of dollars, does not mean you're gonna to continue to be a recipient of dollars unless you can demonstrate measurably what your impact has been with those resources. So hear me when I say I'm a data nerd and I'm looking for jobs created, jobs retained, or if it is not something that's tangible, I, I, can, I can deal in the theater, theoretical in as much as it is it's creating an ecosystem for opportunity. Great, that's fair, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Cornell. Thanks, Nan. Um, I, we did have one question come in, Cornell, just circling back to infrastructure, um, having to do with the Birmingham Northern Beltline. 
Um, and the question is, are, are you aware of the Beltline? Are you aware that it's a top infrastructure priority for the BBA and that it's a critical project for the region? So I'll just stop there and see if, if that's No, I can answer that very quickly. In my six week, I, I probably have had maybe one cursory conversation about it. So I am not thoroughly immersed in that subject matter yet. Daryl, uh, can we set up a call uh, or meeting so that we can uh, review that with uh, Mr. Wesley and go over all the benefits for our region and the uh, progress we've made uh, on funding uh, in very recent years from the federal side and, and plans we have for the local uh, 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 community as well to uh, engage on that project and, and, and get the benefits for our community. I look forward yes. to it. Yes, Mr. Taylor, I'll step it up. Yes, sir. That I'll sounds fantastic. Quiet. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, no, and, I'm, I'm, I'm elated to do it. Let's do it. And Cornell, uh, Michael Taylor's done a lot of work on this. There, there's a lot of resources in play. So I'll be reaching out to your office to step it up because he's done a lot of work over the last couple of years. And it's, it's a really big deal. It's, it's outstanding. So yes. Excited about it. Let's do it. Let's lock it down in the short term. Done, Great. sir. Thank you, Michael. Great. Well, one more we wanted to ask you about, Cornell, is if you're familiar with the World Games. Hopefully you are. Um, hopefully you are familiar Absolutely. with that one. And, you know, if, if there's any plans for um, your office and the city to maximize that opportunity and just any thoughts you have on, on the World Games coming up. What an amazing opportunity that is. Uh, and I guess I'll, I'll share this with you, uh, everyone who's on the phone. Uh, I guess this is breaking news because uh, it hadn't been made public yet, but it will be made public here um, in the, probably within the next 24 to 48 hours, we'll be releasing some press around it. So the, for, the Office of Sports and Entertainment uh, is now housed in our office, in the Office of Innovation and Economic Opportunity. We've gone through a merger. Um, and so, uh, to, to, so this office is now directly responsible for the, the World Game experience as it pertains to the city of Birmingham's involvement, right? Uh, and so the opportunities that are gonna be presented there, uh, I guess the thing that I'm most excited about is being is providing an opportunity for all of our small businesses uh, to be vendors uh, and to be able to reap the economic benefit of all of the bodies and human capital that will be coming to Birmingham to experience this. So if you are a small business owner and you are listening to the sound of my voice, I encourage you to visit the World Games website and, 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 and get thoroughly immersed with our vendor application and process, uh, process because there are going to be other RFPs that will be released. Um, and it's a great opportunity for you to, to, to showcase your business and have some real teeth in, in what the World Games will, from an experiential standpoint, be for the city of Birmingham. Um, I know it's probably not the best answer you're looking for in terms of what we view as the impact, but I think we all have a great understanding of how huge this is for not just Birmingham, the state and the region abroad uh, in terms of what it will generate. What I don't want to do, um, and typically when, when communities are recipients of these sorts of events, is that there are a ton of investments in, in massive buildings and infrastructure that once that it, it event is gone, you're stuck with. And, 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 and understand our focus in terms of advising the administration will be and being extremely targeted on what we invest in to ensure the best use of those facilities and or resources post world games are something that we can continue to value, continue to deploy, continue to leverage and continue to use. We don't wanna be stuck holding the proverbial bag uh, of, a, of an asset we can no longer deploy. And so we're gonna be extremely intentional in ensuring that Birmingham is best positioned uh, to receive and to continue to grow post World Games as well. That's great. A lot of excitement about the World Games, I know. Um, well, Cornell, we've got time for one more question, if that's okay. Um, one more question that came in just regarding job creation and capital investments. And um, the question is um, your thoughts on which industry sectors will create the most uh, growth potential in Birmingham? Well, it's kind of hard to say which ones will create the most impact. I can tell you supply chain is in logistics. We're beginning to develop a national reputation around that. We've always had a, a reputation amount around medical research, uh, bioscience. But I, again, I'm gonna come back because I'm somewhat old school in my thinking in that light manufacturing is a big driver. These are high paying jobs. These are jobs that are typically based in communities or, or in areas 
where there's not a ton of density, but there's a ton of impact that you can have by placing those manufacturing firms there. Uh, so those are, I guess, you know, four or five of them. And, and quite candidly, I would say that Birmingham has a specific place to play in automobile as well. If, if you've been following the news, you see UAB has been a recipient of a grant that they will be focusing on uh, electric battery creation and doing research around it. While we may not be the one who manufactures it here, uh, we can totally cre uh, be intentional around being a supplier base or supplier hub to support all of where the automobile industry is going. Uh, University of Alabama has some unique assets around the research for the automobile industry. Now we hear UAB is coming online. That means the education community is seeing the trend that we too are seeing. Are we gonna work together and collaboratively to ensure that we have the best position to receive those companies when they, when they undoubtedly will identify Birmingham as a place of, of, of employment opportunities. So simply put, bioscience, light manufacturing, we're gonna to continue to support medical research, but we also wanna see it be innovative in its approach and actually spin off into job creation. Uh, okay, not just research, but something that actually is portable and remains in our community. Listen, I don't want us to, to build a house for the house to get moved elsewhere. So mm -hmm. anything that we're going to champion, we want to make certain it remains in, in the region as well. Mary Pat, I realize I'm talking a lot. One more thing. I'm going yes, to ask if possible for Michael Staley to come back on. Could yes, I'd like you to hear the quick version of what what he's doing, name his organization, and why this is important. So, so Michael, come back, please, and give us the Cliff Notes version of, of why this meeting is important. Well, the Birmingham uh, Northern Beltline is the number one uh, project uh, for infrastructure uh, in the region and probably the state. Uh, it represents a 52 uh, mile, well, I'm going to say it's part of the Appalachian Development Highway System. This is a highway system that was created in 1965 to close gaps left out of the interstate system as it was originally built. Uh, I-22, which collect, connects Memphis uh, to Birmingham, was one of the corridors on that system. And the Northern Beltline is designated on that system as well. The system historically has been funded directly by Congress until FY 1998. Uh, then it became just another project within the Highway Trust Fund which meant the states had to choose these, these projects over others. Uh, our state has finished um, I-22. The Northern Beltline uh, stretches um, from west to east across the northern parts and western parts of Jefferson County. Um, and if you think about I-459 and the impact that I-459 had on Birmingham with each of the exits on the Birmingham region, uh, that is the scope of what the Northern Beltline is, it is to complete a circumferential loop uh, for of interstate around Birmingham. We're one of the largest- like 285 in Atlanta. Yeah, we're one of the largest metropolitan areas that doesn't have a loop uh, around. It. And so uh, it creates enormous, we will share with you when we meet and anyone on this call that's interested, uh, studies conducted by the University of Alabama uh, and also studies from the Appalachian Regional Commission in DC showing enormous economic benefit potential uh, of the project. And uh, construction has already begun on the first segment. And in the last uh, two years, uh, Senator Shelby and Congressman Adderholt and the congressional delegation as a whole, Congresswoman Sewell uh, has been a great leader on this as uh, Congressman Palmer. Uh, they all have supported it. We have reinstated the federal funding uh, for good. the Appalachian Development Highway System. And one final key point, money that comes to Alabama for the Appalachian Development Highway System cannot be spent on any other project and it does not take away from any other project. That is the most important thing is this is money we will either spend on this project or we will leave it on the table, but there is no other option. So, um, so it's not, not competing with other projects. It's 100%. The federal funds are 100%. And um, we are very excited to share this with uh, anyone who would like to learn more. And I will say one final thing again, another final final. Uh, over the years, it has, uh, it has kind of ebbed and flowed. Uh, 
the Northern Belt Line is something everybody's heard of. And maybe in the back of your mind, you think, heard of that, but I doubt it's ever going to happen. And I'm here to tell y'all the way that everything's lining up right now, we're in a very good position to complete the project. And what we need is continued support. We have a, every mayor in Jefferson County signed a letter in support of this last year. So tell me, awesome. there, there's not many other projects I can think of that have that uh, feather in their cap. Absolutely. Thank oh, you, man. I'm looking forward to our meeting. Me as well. Thank you. Great. Um, well, thanks, Michael. That's very helpful. I know how important that project is. I, I've been hearing about the Northern Belt Line for, I think, 20 years now. So <laughs> I hope we can, we can get that one done with Cornell's help. So um, unless there's anything else, um, I think we are uh, good to wrap up. Cornell just cannot thank you enough. I know how busy you are. You're in the beginning weeks of your new position, and we are so grateful to you. Um, to have this opportunity. So thanks so much. We all look forward to working with you and wish you the best of luck. Well, I will say this before I drop off. Uh, uh, again, in my six week, uh, I, I understand that some people may have had some difficulty in trying to contact the office. I want to leave my contact information and assure you that we are available to answer any questions. Um, so my email address is my name. If you have in front of you a big old picture of myself, that is the correct spelling of my name. Uh, so you will say Cornell.Wesley at, and you, everybody should be able to spell the city of Birmingham at BirminghamAL.gov. That is, again, Cornell.Wesley at BirminghamAL.gov. My cell phone number, which rings in my pocket, area code 205-335-7100. Again, that's area code 205-335-7179. Um, if you want to call the office directly and reach anyone beyond myself, we have an amazing staff here, and you have anything specific to the programs, then I would invite you to call the office directly. Again, that number is 205-254-2799. Again, 205-254-2799. I look forward to working with you guys. If you see me out in the community, you know, shoot me the deuces or give me some, some uh, air fist uh, in a socially distant way. And I look forward to interacting with you all. Wonderful. Well, thanks Cornell. Thanks everybody for joining today. We will see everyone at our next meeting on Monday, March 15th. So hope everybody stays healthy between now and then and look forward to seeing you in March. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks everybody.